Diane Schulte was born September 16, 1954, and lived in Nampa, Idaho with her husband, Fred. She's described as being very introverted, insecure, and non-social, and often avoided people. She did not have any friends in the area, did not associate with any of her neighbors, and apparently did not have an interest in becoming acquainted with any of her husband's friends. She rarely left home except to walk to the local Nampa Public Library. She was last seen at her home on Delaware Avenue on the morning of March 25, 1977, at the age of 22. Her husband, Fred, said that she told him several times that morning that she didn't feel well before he went to work at 7.20 a.m. When he returned home from work that day, she was nowhere to be found. There were no indications of a struggle or forced entry to the home. The car was still parked at the home, which was not unusual because she often walked to the library. There was mail in the mailbox and a UPS package on the porch. All of Diane's belongings, including her purse and money, were left behind at home. The only thing missing was the clothes she was wearing that morning. Diane's three cats were locked in the spare bedroom, which is where she normally left them whenever she went out, but she left her wedding ring and watch on top of a desk, which is where she kept them when she was at home or only going out for a few minutes. One of their neighbors said the Schultes were a devoted pair who were quiet and kept to themselves. There are no reports of domestic disturbances and they did not have children, nor were they known to smoke, drink, or use drugs. In fact, several friends and neighbors call them the ideal couple. Diane's grandmother stated that Diane was highly upset and emotional during their last phone conversation because her hyper-religious parents were coming to visit later in the year. Diane didn't want to see them and had asked Fred to persuade them to cancel the trip. However, Fred stated his wife was in an unusually good mood just prior to her disappearance because they had celebrated their second wedding anniversary. A week after Diane vanished, police asked Fred to take a polygraph test about his wife's disappearance and he agreed. The test was scheduled for the following week, but on April 3rd, Fred's body was found inside his wife's dark blue 1975 Buick. He had been driving northbound on Highway 95 at a high rate of speed when he shot himself and then the car ran off the road and down an embankment. He left behind two suicide notes. The first was a wheel, and in the second, Fred would thank everyone who has tried to help find Diane, including families, friends, co-workers, neighbors, and the Nampa Police Department. He goes on to talk about the strong bond he and his wife had together and how he could no longer live without her. The letters would then go into what can be best described as a rambling manifesto where Fred blamed society, politicians, businessmen, and even the nation's gross national product for the lack of justice in the world. Neither of the notes indicated that Fred knew what had happened to her. His suicide led to a follow-up investigation into their home. They found that an oval area rug was missing from the home and a four-inch square had been cut out of the nearby drapes. Investigators wondered if possibly a secret abusive relationship in the home could explain Diane's reclusiveness or is her behavior simply a case of severe social anxiety, which was not well understood in the 70s. Police have not named Fred as a suspect in his wife's disappearance, but foul play is suspected and as of today, the case remains unsolved. Matthew J. Bronco was born November 13, 1984, to Jim and Cynthia and nicknamed Matt. His mother described him as thoughtful, intelligent, and quiet. He had earned a bachelor's in political science in 2008 at the Idaho State University and planned to go back and pursue his master's degree. He worked at the Shoshone Bannock Tribes, but in March 2019, he was either terminated or resigned for unknown reasons. On March 20th, 2019, Matt's mother would last see him at their home on 172 North Rio Vista Road in Fort Hall, Idaho. This was two days after he departed his job at the Shoshone Bannock Tribes. He and his Dotson named Afa would leave in his truck, but it was unclear where they were going. Sadly, this was the last time his family saw him. The day before he went missing, he withdrew the last $250 from his bank account. The next day, witnesses saw his 2011 Toyota Tacoma parked on Interstate 84 eastbound in the small remote town of Snowville, Utah, near an exit ramp, and they saw him walk in AFA nearby. On March 22nd, his mother tried to find his cell phone via GPS and located it in the place he had been seen the previous day, which was 95 miles south of Fort Hall, about a two-hour drive. 
His truck was locked with his cell phone, wallet, tribal identification card, driver's license, and bank cards inside. His wallet did not have the $250 he had gotten out of the bank before he disappeared. His mother, who had a spare key to the truck, took it to the nearest gas station and refueled it before she drove it back to Fort Hall. She asked people around Snowville if they'd seen Matt, but no one recognized his photos or remembered him or his dog. The next day, she reported him missing. On March 27th, a person in Snowville contacted Matt's mother and said someone had found his dog, Alpha, at Exit 5 on Interstate 84, two miles from where he was last seen walking him six days earlier. Alpha was alive and well and appeared to have been taken care of over the past six days. However, there was no sign of Matt. There was an extensive two-day search of an eight-mile radius from I-84 exit ramps where the pickup truck and his dog were found. Utah Search and Rescue and their dogs were utilized, along with searchers on horseback, and the Utah Sheriff's Office launched a drone to assist in the search. Matt's truck was retrieved at home by the Fort Hall police detectives and stored at their facility until detectives were able to process the vehicle for investigation. Cell phone data, fingerprints, and DNA results are still pending. His family believes he was depressed when he disappeared, but states he would have never abandoned his dog, committed suicide, or left and never contacted them again. There were several unconfirmed sightings of him, and some of the sightings were declared cases of mistaken identity. Matt was 34 years old when he disappeared, and authorities believe he may be living a transient life now or may be on another reservation outside his own tribe. But if he chose this life, it seems that he would have taken his dog that he loved with him. It should be noted that the Idaho Missing Persons Clearinghouse lists Matthew as an involuntary abduction missing person, which means law enforcement may know more than the public is aware of. However, as of today, this case remains unsolved. Amber Hoops was born December 27, 1980, and lived with her grandparents, Norris and Kathleen Bergener, in Idaho Falls. She was described as very shy and had only a small, close group of friends. She enjoyed church, her family, singing, playing the piano, and creative writing. She worked as a nanny and also at her grandparents' classic truck and auto body shop that was attached to their house. On September 14, 2001, she spoke on the phone with her sister until 10 p.m. She was thought to be in her bedroom when her grandparents went to bed around 10.30. Her grandmother Kathleen would wake up around 1 a.m. and notice that Amber was not in her room, but her TV and lights were on and the back door was unlocked. The computer monitor in the auto shop was also on, and Amber sometimes used it to email her friends. Kathleen woke up Norris, and they both started looking for her together, but they couldn't find her and would call the police. Strangely, one of the shop's pickup trucks was missing from their parking lot as well. Shortly after Amber was reported missing, this truck was discovered two miles away in a parking lot on Lincoln Road. The keys were still in the ignition, but there were no signs of Amber or anything else. Keith Hescock has been investigated for possible involvement in Amber's disappearance. He had worked for the Bergeners in the past and had quit on bad terms. He was also friends with one of her relatives. He allegedly had a vendetta against Norris for reasons unknown to the public. Hescock is also a person of interest in the disappearance of nine-year-old Stephanie Crane from Chalice, Idaho in 1993. His neighbor would say he was hunting in Chalice, Idaho the weekend Stephanie disappeared from that location. He also owned a yellow pickup truck similar to the one that was seen in the area near Stephanie around the time she disappeared. His only criminal record in Idaho had been for poaching, but he had felony convictions in other states. On June 2, 2002, Hescock kidnapped a 14-year-old girl from outside her home in the early morning hours. Thankfully, she was able to escape after being chained to a bed in his home when he went to work that afternoon. The police waited on him to return home and attempted to arrest him, but he fled in his vehicle and led them on a 40-mile chase, which ended at a dead-end road in the Big Hole Mountains. There he shot and killed a police dog, shot an officer in the leg, and then committed suicide. In 2006, Governor Butch Otter enacted the Idaho Missing Persons Day into law. This day is honored every year on September 14th to commemorate the day that Amber went missing, as well as to honor all Idaho missing persons. As of today, Amber has never been found and the case remains unsolved.
Reuben Felix was born on October 18, 1994. On February 23, 1997, when he was two years old, he was with his stepfather, Aurelia Morellis, and his family at Tanupa Ranch along the Littlewood River in rural Shoshone, Idaho for a family gathering. His mother, Rosanna, had to go to work and would leave Reuben and his younger half-brother with Aurelio. He was last seen sitting in the front yard drinking his bottle. His stepfather said he went inside the house for a moment, and when he returned, Reuben had disappeared. Dogs traced Reuben's scent for 200 yards from the house across a field, up an embankment, over the railroad tracks, and through a small pasture to the edge of the Little Wood River. Searchers found a child-sized footprint in the snow on the riverbank. Authorities searched the river several times and dragged it five times looking for remains, but found nothing. In late March 1997, Reuben's family found his bottle in the yard near the house where he was last seen. The area had previously been searched several times, and no one had seen the bottle there before. Police were unable to determine where it came from or how it came to be there. Reuben's mother believes foul play is involved in her son's disappearance. Years after he disappeared, she got a call from a man who identified himself as the FBI agent investigating Reuben's disappearance. The caller said he had traced Reuben to Guadalajara, Mexico, where he was sold to a wealthy family, and that she should meet him at the FBI office in Twin Falls, Idaho. Reuben's mother went to the FBI office, but no one there knew what she was talking about. This is when she was told that the FBI agent investigating Reuben's case had retired. In 2007, FBI agents told her it was possible that Reuben had been kidnapped and sold. She divorced her husband after Reuben's disappearance and believes his family might have been involved, but the reason is unclear. It is unknown if Reuben drowned in the river, if foul play is involved, or if he is in Mexico. He remains missing, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Christopher Charles Loesch was born August 30, 1990. His mother, Tina, met Skye Hansen when they were serving time in prison, and they began a romantic relationship. Tina was released in 1991, when Christopher was about a year old. Skye was released nine months after Tina, and that's when the couple moved in together. Tina would eventually come out as gay to her father, Gary Loesch, who in turn would remove her from his will. He said he always had a bad feeling about Skye, who had immediately began asking him and Tina's mother, Barbara, for money. Mysteriously, in 1996, Gary was found shot to death in his car while he was out delivering newspapers. Unfortunately, police were unable to find any leads in the case and it eventually went cold. Following the murder of her father, Tina and her mother became much closer. Tina would suspiciously take out a $530,000 life insurance policy out on her mother and only eight months later, she was found dead in her hot tub with an unplugged TV floating in the water. Although her death was initially deemed suspicious, the coroner ultimately ruled it an accident. When Tina received the insurance payout, she would immediately sign over the entire amount to Skye. This is where Brad Stackman comes into the picture, because while he was serving time for murdering 89-year-old Dorothy Martin, he was clearly bragging to other inmates about being involved in Barbara's death. Eventually, Stackman confessed to electrocuting and drowning Barbara after being promised $10,000 by Tina and Skye. However, after the job was done, he would never receive the money that was promised to him. Stackman had met Tina and Skye after being hired on to work for them at their home improvement business. After confessing to Barbara's murder, authorities reopened the investigation into Gary's case. Investigators believe Tina was somehow involved, but have been unable to prove this. Turns out that Skye had told Steckman to go in and steal a diamond ring she had seen in Dorothy Martin's home while they were working there. But Dorothy surprised Steckman while he was attempting to steal it and he smothered her. It was determined that Tina's son Christopher had been in the care of another couple, Steve Castle and Julie Twyford, between 1999 and 2000. Steve was involved in Skye's buying and selling a property, while Julie was an attorney who had helped Tina get her life insurance payout. The couple had enrolled Christopher at Shiloh Hills Elementary School in Spokane under the name of Christopher Robinson, with Christopher being spelled with a C instead of K. But one day, he stopped showing up and no request was ever made to forward his transcripts elsewhere. 
He was apparently being homeschooled by his mother and Skye for a time in 2000 and 2001. It is assumed that the women were on the run for many years with Christopher after finding out that Steckman was talking to police. On October 10, 2008, warrants were issued for Skye and Tina's arrest for Barbara's murder. In November, the television crime show America's Most Wanted ran a story appealing for information on Skye, Tina, and Christopher's whereabouts. Less than three hours after the show aired, Tina and Skye were found shot to death in an SUV northwest of Tucson, Arizona, but there was no sign of Christopher at the scene. Turns out, the women had entered into a suicide pact together. Tina shot Skye and then herself. They each left behind a suicide note, but did not leave any clues as to where Christopher could be. He would have been 18 years old at the time. As of today, Christopher has never been located and the case remains unsolved.